I've got 301 by my clock. So if we may get started, um, Craig, could you um, do us a favor and read the um, needed statement for us to have a Zoom meeting, sir? Certainly, will do. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and state of emergency, this meeting is being held by a live video teleconference pursuant to 2020 Senate Bill 150 and in accordance with KRS 61826 because it is not feasible to offer a primary physical location for the meeting. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, if we, we would like to recognize that we're fortunate enough to have our um, Mayor Gordon with us. Um, Mayor, could you say a few words if you would like? Sure. You know, I like to pop in every now and then and see what's going on. And thank you very much. Um, just I continue to appreciate all of you serving because this uh, process and the results from it will be really important for our planning commission in the future and uh, for, of course, the future of Lexington. So thanks for your continued service and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, hopefully everyone has received their board packet distributed by Craig. In that board packet, there are the meeting minutes from December 16th. Um, Hopefully everyone has had a chance to review those. And if I could get a motion to accept the minutes, unless anyone has any um, changes they would like to see. So moved. Second. Great. If we, if we could raise our hands and, and say all in favor. All in favor. Any, any opposed? Aye. Very well, the, the minutes are accepted. Thank you very much, Craig, for those wonderful minutes. Um, if we could move on then to our uh, first order of business, which is a uh, presentation by the Stantec team. Mark and John, are you all with us? I am here, I think, and I saw John a second ago, so I believe we're right. all here. Uh, there might be others on the attendee side, uh, but uh, I think that we'll start out with John and myself and uh, go from there. Wonderful. Uh, well, I want, first want to uh, ask Craig if he had any uh, initial business that he wanted to start out with as well. I don't know if uh, you had mentioned some notes to me if you wanted to do that first or wanted me to go first. I have um, a separate agenda item just for an update after this presentation and discussion, so I can, I can wait until after we get through this part. Okay. All right. Well, then I'll get started. I'm going to share my screen here. and uh, uh, kind of get underway with what our plan is for today. Uh, our goal is uh, to really go over the scenario descriptions and evaluation criteria we have identified and try to explain how we're gonna use uh, the criteria to evaluate uh, these scenarios. Uh, and uh, I'll start with a few introductions. My name is Mark Butler, I'm the project manager, uh, the other uh, presenter today will be John Buker, also from Stantec, and he is in uh, our local office as well. Um, we also have Ed Holmes, who's our engagement uh, leader from EHI Consultants. And uh, it, depending on, uh, if, if I see them on the participant list, uh, Cynthia Albright is our land use and GIS lead, uh, and perhaps we'll have some folks from our uh, MXD and Urban 3 as well. Uh, but uh, just to give you a brief uh, uh, update on our status, uh, we are, uh, things are coming in uh, hot and heavy on the data side. We've had some really good conversations in the last week or two uh, regarding uh, the PBA data, uh, building permit data, water usage data, even uh, the revenue occupational and tax uh, license fee data. All that is uh, in various forms of process uh, some is still outstanding, but uh, well, uh, well, soon to be uh, in our possession. Uh, and all that is going to be uh, synthesized and uh, organized to be put in our existing conditions and growth trends report. Uh, so uh, we are going to be using that data uh, as the basis for filling in our uh, or framework, evaluation framework, including these criteria. So, so a lot of the criteria we'll talk about today 
is based on this data that we're receiving from the city and from other sources. Uh, I will mention briefly that uh, we are using, we, there was a discussion about uh, CoStar real estate data the last, uh, on our last call last month. Uh, we had a good conversation about that with some uh, property appraisers. We were given some opportunity, some leads for some additional data sources. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're still looking for, looking at some other sources, but at this time, uh, we're, CoStar will still be in the mix. It's not the sole data source, uh, but we do believe, especially for the uh, surrounding counties, it provides a very comprehensive uh, uh, method for getting at those larger regional trends that we need to understand uh, the future demand for uh, land development and the various land development uh, classes within uh, the Lexington metro market. Uh, so we, inside of Fayette County, we have a great amount of PVA data, building code data, or building permit data, uh, and all the other GIS data that we have from the city, and that's good. And really, the CoStar will be uh, supplementing that at a regional level uh, and also providing a, a context for the Fayette level data we have. So uh, all of this is to say that we we'll, should have a, a, an existing conditions report uh, pretty soon, as soon as we have all our data locked down and processed, uh, hopefully in the next month, uh, we can have a, a preliminary draft available uh, for your review uh, or discussion uh, in our next call. Uh, Art, can I ask real quickly, uh, sure. what percentage of your information will you be gathering from the PBA? Because I know that that was the area that Dennis was the happiest with. Um, the, I, I don't know if I can put it in terms of percentage, but what we are using from the PBA is sales trends. Uh, mm -hmm. We are using uh, the the data, the, the uh, building type and land use type. Uh, it, it really is the parcel. It is a part of the parcel level, parcel layer. Parcel layer. So it'll be uh, very much the basis for how we uh, establish the base inventory of various land types. Okay, um, great, thank you. Yeah, and he's also given us access to some, like again, the sales data is uh, is uh, historical. So that's helped us develop these trend lines. And that was really one of the things that the CoStar data uh, was most attracted to us was that it allowed, a, it, it was historical data and allowed us to do that in one, one location uh, in, that means we can use it again and again and again in the future if we wanted to. Uh, if we don't want to use it, uh, you know, that's up to the, you know, the client, the city to decide, you, the task force. But for us initially, it's, it was a good source, especially for the rest. Uh, and I would also say that the building permit data will also be similarly valuable. Uh, all of this stuff at the parcel level really creates the big data analysis that Urban 3 is going to do to really uh, conceptualize in a spatial way the revenue and cost of various development patterns. Uh, so the PVA data in that regard is critical. Good, thank you. Sure. Uh, all right, so uh, one of the questions that stuck out from last meeting was, well, what are, you keep talking about these scenarios, but what really are they? And, uh, and that was spurred us to say, we really need to get these down in writing. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, where we're, uh, we're gonna talk about today. And, Ultimately, please feel free to, uh, you know, interject with a question or a comment. The, import, the purpose here is to uh, get your feedback and your suggestions for improving these scenarios. Um, they are the start, they are the basis for our evaluation framework development. Uh, and they're intended to be, to be practical and realistic, but also the theoretical bounds of the various build out scenarios that are, going to or like could likely occur inside of the urban service boundary going forward. Again, just to make it clear, we're not a, like our scope is limiting to us to considering the available land within inside of the urban service boundary. Uh, and so that's, we're staying within that basic construct. Uh, with that being said, you know, one of the foundational premises of uh, our scenarios is that there's a finite supply of land inside the urban service boundary. Uh, this link could be new undeveloped land, a land that has not yet been developed, greenfield land, or it could be land that will be redeveloped uh, be, as 
it, it becomes uh, you know appropriate or practical to do that. Uh, whether that's something that's uh, you know a, a, a obsolete parcel, uh, obsolete property, or even something that's vacant inside the uh, urban inside the more urban core, so to speak, that has uh, that is now at the time it's going for it to be redeveloped. Uh, in terms of the demand for this land, uh, you know, if the land is a supply, the demand for converting it uh, to develop space, uh, all of this is based, we're setting a basic uh, universal, and so you know, for lack of a better term, across all three scenarios, a basic uh, set, let, set of demand uh, based on growth trends that we're seeing from the, well, from the, the data we have, both the building permit data in COSTAR and other uh, economic indicators, and it'll be applied to each scenario evenly uh, or e equally. And again, that data, that those trend lines, that supply is based on what our uh, re real estate experts or land use experts uh, have baked into the medium and long-term trends they've seen uh, in Lexington. So that's where we start. And then we uh, have these three scenarios. Uh, so our first scenario starts at one end of the spectrum of what as all, and of course all of these are practicable inside of Imagine Lexington, but our first scenario starts at one end of that spectrum, which is to say the baseline. And it estimates, it's, we're in this scenario, we're gonna estimate the available land for each land use category in, a, in the most conservative fashion basically reflecting what is allowed where today. So according to the zoning map as it occurs today, according to the development uh, limitations or uh, guidance that's on the books today, we can quantify the vacant and underutilized land in the city. Uh, now we are still having stakeholder meetings. Uh, we're still getting information from uh, various uh, you know, the party is about how to explicitly uh, understand vacant and underutilized land. But this is as best as, of all the scenarios, this is the, our best application of basically the math. Uh, what we're trying to, trying to establish a baseline of what, if we just went by the books, what would be uh, considered uh, developable inside the boundary. Um, and so part of that is, you know, just the, the idea that, will con continue to developing developments that we're, we're used to seeing uh, inside of Fayette County. So, uh, you know, they can be modern and in, 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 in reflects newer trends in development. Here we have a, a newer subdivision. We have an older uh, retail uh, complex off of Tates Creek, and we have uh, Stantex office building in uh, Beaumont Center. Um, these are the types of developments that, you know, we're all used to seeing and they're all built at the, you know, within the zoning and uh, densities that are currently allowed. And that's basically what we're talking about. And it'll give us, like I said, our baseline for uh, uh, on one side of the spectrum. Uh, as we move towards implementing the policy goals of Imagine Lexington, uh, we should see as these goals get uh, codified and brought into practice, a little bit more flexibility opportunities for more density perhaps, uh, other types of uh, policies and, and incentives that create more flexibility. And uh, in, in, in reality, what will happen is the, the proposals, the, the projects that are currently in development that have been approved, uh, that are a part of scenario one, uh, those will still be in scenario two. It's a lot of this, these scenarios kind of build off each other, as you can imagine. Uh, and it really where we see the fruition occurring of these policies is as they become implemented and uh, you know, they tar start to have the intended effect. So what is currently planned for today is going to be there uh, in scenario two, but it's going to be supplemented in the areas where there is you know, that there hasn't necessarily been a uh, approved development uh, at a location. You know, maybe these areas will see some of these uh, policy goals reflected in how they're developed, which may imply, you know, more flexibility for one type of uh, land use than another or greater density, et cetera. Uh, and it, this assumes that uh, these, uh, 
you know, the, the changes we're talking about are not particularly, you know, uh, radical or controversial. These are the things that the city is already working on. And it assumes that the city and the, and the planning staff and everybody involved continues to push those policies forward. So what are we talking about? It's the stuff, like again, non-controversial stuff. Rezonings uh, that, that you know, reflect some obvious changes that would likely occur. Uh, and we're still talking theoretical. We're not going through the maps and like saying, this is gonna be rezoned like this. We're just saying these things will, could happen in scenario two versus scenario one. Uh, enhancements within the, a, a zoning class that could allow more different uses or uh, higher densities. Uh, streamlining for the, the amendment process. Again, things that are already kind of in the works. Uh, revised parking regulations. Uh, you know, I know that was something that Lampo staff had mentioned to me that they've, that's been under consideration internally for a while. And perhaps that, that would be something that we would see in scenario two over the next 10, 20 years uh, or sooner. Uh, uh, additional funds for affordable housing, uh, that is obviously uh, supported and uh, desired by many uh, folks in the community. And that, that would obviously have the effect of new affordable housing developments in, in scenario two. Uh, and then other uh, other other uh, measures for uh, equity and affordable housing for uh, neighborhoods that are transitioning uh, and feeling development pressure. We see those strategies being placed, put into place, and discussed. And that's that kind of stuff is what we consider in uh, scenario two. So again, uh, it's all gradual. It's nothing radical. I'm using today pictures that of of developments that are here today so you know that it's kind of to make the point that um this isn't something that we have to like look to portland or uh you know some other progressive european city to see happening it's stuff that's happening today it's just whereas once we, we might have seen more of a, a convention a different style that we've seen in the last 20 years we start to see this evolution uh and uh you know here we see uh the the town center drive off Lee Sound Road, the new apartment building in downtown in the, you know, a small uh, footprint uh, light industrial space on Fortune Drive, uh, really taking advantage of the space that's available inside the, the city. Uh, so finally, uh, we have scenario three, which represents the, uh, the outer bound of uh, what's, uh, I would say, practical, but also progressive um, of in Imagine Lexington. It's uh, an attempt to really try to uh, best embody the goals of placemaker, uh, the goals of really taking advantage of all of our resources and inventory inside the boundary, um, if the most, as efficiently as we can, uh, and, and with the creativity that that would require. Uh, so again, uh, it builds on scenario two. We've been making these policy improvements, you know, incrementally, uh, and in addition to uh, these things being driven at the city level by planners, by the planning commission, uh, we're now seeing the buy-in of the development community, the, the buy-in of the public at large that see a Fritz farm and say, that's kind of what I wanna see all over Lexington. You know, uh, I wanna see like the kind of neighborhoods that, uh, have, that are being promoted and uh, proposed in the Imagine Nich Nicholasville Road study. Uh, you know, people recognizing that there's a lot of opportunities for infill development downtown and in other neighborhoods that are conducive for those types of in development. And even in Greenfield development, recognizing that we want a better mix of uh, uses and um, uh, pedestrian scales, et cetera, that are more efficient with our land. Uh, and so the it'll be gradual, but it'll be different. It will no longer be like, well, only the people that pay attention to the stuff will notice it. It'll be the stuff that say, have you seen, have you been out to Fritz Farm? No, that it'll be that kind of stuff that we see popping out more often of the city. And all this is to say that, um, you know, it's, it's an aggressive strategy in the sense it requires a lot of buy-in from a lot of different groups. Uh, and it'll require, uh, you know, additional policies, additional money spent on other, public services that can support that kind of uh, that kind of development effort or development pattern, such as, you know, the transit oriented development, uh, you know, the, the transit, higher transit on the corridors uh, that would be serving Nicholasville Road, for example, it would require perhaps 
uh, an investment in new infrastructure in the older parts of town that has aging infrastructure that would have to be uh, significantly updated to support more intense development. However, uh, it's still limited to what is practicable for Louisville, or I'm sorry, Lexington. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really the, the key here is that we're not trying to just throw in maximum density. Uh, we, we want to like have a scenario three once it's about what we believe is possible and practical for the city. And that's a lot more of the kind of mixed, uh, you know, missing middle, the, the, the mid-sized urban development in many more places than we see now, but also uh, significant urban development. Um, and to make, to make that, keep that us grounded in that, that, that uh, you know, that goal, uh, we're looking at, like we talked about last month, uh, looking at the proposals that have already been made. Uh, and of course, some of these proposals may be a part of scenario two, but, you know, imagine the Crystal Road in uh, the Grow Smart plan from Fayette Alliance. They have lots of uh, examples of uh, development patterns and in de individual developments that we could say, you know, we're not, without endorsing them, to say this is what we would imagine scenario three would be like, uh, and uh, that's where we would uh, make it, uh, bring it to the 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 tangible level that we could actually measure the differences with our evaluation criteria. So I'm going to stop. And so in the, here's some pictures. Again, I threw in some pictures just to <laughs> kind of give you a you know, a visual break from the words, but also like, you know, give you that visual imagery. Um, again, stuff that's already happening. We haven't, we have new development that focuses on downtown. We have uh, the Fritz Farm uh, where we've seen, uh, you know, some of this more and more dense or, or intense uh, residential and mixed use pedestrian oriented retail and office space. Um, it doesn't all have to be as fancy or high end as these examples, but uh, it's the pattern and uh, it's uh, kind of what, uh, you know, is in representative of scenario three, among many other things. Um, so anyway, I will stop there for the moment uh, and ask if anyone has any uh, initial comments or questions about the scenarios themselves and how we plan to use them. I'd like to ask a question. Sure. In gross scenario three, how do you address what the market is calling for in regard to, let's say, I think Lexington would be very happy if 20% of the market was was buying high density units. Sure. 80% of the market in Lexington, I mean, it is Lexington, it is gonna want something with some green space in the backyard and, and, and things like that, where the kids can go out and swing on their, their swing. How does Gross Scenario 3 address that instead of just making everything a high density? Well, I th well, we'll get into that with, when we go through the evaluation criteria, I think we'll touch on it, but I'll mention, I'll, 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 I would say it's a, it does relate to uh, how we, uh, you know, we have a population as, uh, expectation of, and we'll have that by a certain age cohort demographic, you know, so we will know uh, the, the kind of the housing cycle, the life cycle, the very of the residents, the households of, of Lexington, and and that's you know really what our demand is. You know the demand side for residential for this example, uh, and so we do expect that for you know young families, people buying their first home or second home that want a single family home, in a scenario three. Uh, there might be, you know, not as many, uh, not quite as many uh, of the land or not as much of the land inventory is uh, converted to single family homes. And therefore, we might miss that market. That market might move out to Jessamine County or Scott County, right? Um, however, it maybe it doesn't affect the amount of single family homes that are developed in Fayette County because uh, we've just within scenario, scenario three, we've just included more units than were possible than in scenario one. Uh, the actual number of single family houses might be the same. Uh, it's just that uh, they're spread out over more space and they take up more space and use up more of the inventory. Uh, so in that sense, we will have, we will measure uh, 
the demand side, we will try to measure how that affects how that affects the perhaps the cost side. You know, what is the uh, price per square foot of new housing in various scenarios, scenario one, scenario two, scenario three, uh, for various classes. Uh, and I think, and that's part of this, that's part of the work is try to quantify what that, uh, the alignment of supply versus demand does to price, what it does to market reaction. Uh, I, we are, we obviously have some, you know, limits to our, the amount of time and effort we can spend on the whole thing, right? And so we've concentrated on Fayette County. But I do think that's part of the reason why we need to have a regional approach is we have to understand that there's going to be a release valve to, you know, people don't have to live in Fayette County and a lot of people don't. Um, and we have to quantify that too. So we may rec recognize in a particular scenario, and this doesn't just apply to uh, residential that apply to commercial as well, uh, industrial, uh, that there might be a demand that due to the constraints of the scenario just doesn't get met and is a trade-off is a lost opportunity. Um, and uh, we will have to do, uh, we'll, we'll have to find a way, uh, the best way to explain that in a, in a way that's uh, sim simple enough, but also uh, everybody agrees on is fair. Uh, and we start with the data that we start with the evaluation criteria and the data that goes along with it to try to come up with that particular method. Mark, if I could add to that very briefly, um, because I that was one of the same questions I was thinking through when we started this process. And I think that's one of the, the big reasons that we're updating the data on a regular basis, that we're trying to make this process repeatable so that when we're taking a look at it, annually or every 18 months or every two years or how often, however often we end up updating this, we'll have to um, take a look at what's really happening on the ground and where the demands really are. Um, because they, those, those actual uh, development patterns may not align exactly with what we find the community consensus to be during this process. Um, community priorities change over time. So um, that's, that's the way I've been thinking about this is that it would be this is this is a dynamic process that we'll be updating on a regular basis. So if those if those demands do change or if they um, become apparent that they're different on the ground than what they are in the study, we'll be able to make those changes as we move forward. Yeah, thank you, Greg. If I may ask, oh, oh go ahead, please. Okay, uh, on the scenario two, where it speaks of ensuring equity and affordable housing strategies that protect vulnerable neighborhoods in transition. Uh, how does that play into this and uh, what does that look like? Do we have any idea at this point? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, I think the, uh, Ed Holmes had it mentioned several or a few um, strategies that are in, that he had, th that he was aware of. Uh, and I think the implication is that we do, uh, we, uh, I do struggle with how to quantify it with a number, right? Um, but I think it's relevant in the sense that, as opposed to like, uh, to not put too harsh of, of, of terminology to it, the laissez-faire nature of scenario one, which might say that uh, neighborhoods close to downtown that are now attractive to new development, uh, just absolutely disregard the, uh, you know, the, the displacement effects of the current residents uh, they're just not considered. Scenario two recognizes that those effects are in fact uh, very real and have to be mitigated. How they're mitigated, that's part of like the conversations we need to have with the stakeholders to, to truly identify what is being done, what's possible, and what the uh, expected uh, you know, benefit or effect of those strategies actually is. Uh, but that's why we include it in scenario two, is that it's a recognition uh, that need, it, it's something that has to be addressed uh, as opposed to a, a, the baseline scenario, which is really just, again, closer to a numbers exercise. Mark, if, if, if I may add quickly to that, what you've added to that, what we're trying to get at is, especially some of those more vulnerable neighborhoods, how do you protect them as you see property taxes increase and those residents that choose to stay in the neighborhood can't afford the increases in property taxes. So 
then you have to start looking at some type of a property tax uh, abatement or enhancement program for residents that are currently choosing to stay in those neighborhoods. One example. All right. Um, I, I, I wanted to mention one other thing that Craig had uh, kind of reminded me of is, you know, it is a dynamic process and these scenarios, while real, we're not endorsing one over the other. We're just trying to flesh them out um, as, I, again, as kind of bookends, as, uh, you know, like mileposts within the spectrum of what could possibly happen. As we move forward, again, if you consider these scenarios more as trajectories, you can kind of, you will know which trajectory you're likely, you're, you're more likely on and where that is going to lead you. And as you update your data, that will become more clear. And as you update your data, you'll understand what the consequences of the trajectory you're on really are. Uh, and hopefully that is what will inform your decisions about land use choices going forward, whether that's you know, a more aggressive infill strategy or, or an expansion of the boundary. Any other thoughts or questions? I had a question. Um, so it's my understanding each of these scenarios is cumulative. Uh, it's kind of a, a step up, uh, you know, phase two, scenario two is, is more intense than scenario one, but you're building off of the data that you're gonna get through scenario one, correct? Correct. Okay, so I keep coming back to the data and um, I understand, you know, you've got these um, you know, we talked to the real real estate data expert, but what kind of timeline of averages will you be looking at? Because we've seen over the past five to 10 years, a, a real decline in retail space. You know, COVID could potentially change out, you know, demands for office space. Um, so I just wanted to come back to this idea that if scenarios two and three are based on the data collected in scenario one, I wanna make sure those data are, are, are spot on. And yeah. are we just looking at Fayette County or are we looking at aggregate for you know, Fayette and Scott and Jesmond to sort of get a sense of what's happening at a regional level? Uh, yes and yes, uh, definitely okay. at a regional level. Uh, we want to try to uh, understand the full demand and really understand uh, Fayette's share of that demand and understanding that it's dynamic, uh, that the, you know, the market and the consumer doesn't necessarily care as much about the county border uh, and that plays a part in it. But uh, in regard to how far back or what trends we use carrying forward, uh, Again, it's a dynamic process. We take this snapshot in time today. We, we, we try to uh, incorporate and take into account the, the various uh, cycles and shocks of the past 10, 15, you know, 20 years okay. uh, as we go forward. And really, again, the demand is really just kind of giving us the benchmark slash the, the, the general idea of what growth would normally expect to be, knowing that it's not gonna be exactly what it is. That's why the data has to be updated. Yeah. But that's also why the data needs to be simple enough to update that it, it doesn't feel like a Herculean process to do it. Uh, so part of our charge here is to develop the database, explain, you know, show where we got it, mm -hmm. make sure that where we got it is reliable, uh, so that in the future, in two years, three years, every time you there's a you know a call to re you know to, to look at it again, um, that data can be updated. You can and again, once we're done with these three scenarios, you don't necessarily need to carry three scenarios forward. You can just say like we believe that this is what we are seeing, and we want to know how much land we have left. You know, uh, and we'll have a method method that we've tried and hopefully agreed upon works well to establish that. Um, I, I mean, and that's the thing is we won't know 
I mean, this is the problem, right? We won't really know what the true effects of COVID are until we see what the effects are. Uh, things could bounce back or things could fundamentally change. Uh, uh, and it's probably something in the middle. Um, so we are, we want to, we will obviously uh, want to try to respect the, that, what we, what we see in, in, in the, the ex expertise that we have uh, in-house in, on the task force and then the stakeholders we talk to. Uh, but the, the trend line going forward itself cannot be like, it, it can't, it, we're not expecting it to be perfect. We're just expecting it to be as good as we can get it. Yeah, I mean, my, my point is that um, unless we start with good data, um, then if we're gonna build off of it, we need to be sure that those data are um, pretty tight. And I saw that you had used the word conservative you would, you know, use a conservative measure. I forget where it is. Scenario one or two. Oh, uh, scenario one. Yeah, we'll be conservative and reflect conventional development practices and existing codes. So, you know, what do we mean by conservative? Because these data, you know, as a baseline, will trigger the question, right? So. Um, I just want to avoid any kind of pushback because the data may not have been um, strong enough. You know, the data will measure very conservatively or very liberally. Do you see what I'm saying? No, I, want, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want the data to be as robust as possible to withstand scrutiny. As well, I, I do too. Um, um, in, 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 a, in a response to your question about what we mean by conservative and conventional, it, it means that in, in our terms of meaning, it is kind of to represent what is occurring now as opposed to saying, well, according to the code, you could totally build out X number of units and X square feet of space to the letter. Uh, and you know, we just had a stakeholder call with developers earlier this morning and one of the developers was, you know, his point blank was not all land is equal. Not all land is really developable to us. Uh, you know, just because there's the city puts everything in vacant. Uh, and while we're not necessarily going to uh, be as con conservative as the most conservative developer, we do want to recognize that there has been a, a development pattern that, is, as, that has existed in the past 20 years that is what we are generally basing scenario one on, the notion that uh, we, we would expect the land to be converted in similar matter, in similar manner. That's what we meant by conventional okay. development. Uh, as opposed to like a really aggressive urban infill strategy per se. Okay, thank you, thank you. Fairs, I just wanted to note that Councilmember Bledsoe had her hand up. Oh, great. Thank you, um, Craig. Thank you, Mark. And I appreciate um, you thinking through all these very challenging um, scenarios well. And uh, to this uh, Phillips point, I think that's true. The data is where it needs to be defensible and needs to explain what we're doing and be um, have buy-in. So just two, two thoughts on things that I think COVID we've talked about. Um, you're not gonna see a shopping mall, mall redeveloped to a single family home with green space for dogs or kids to play. So the developmental land that we talk about as being um, infill does capture townhomes, condos, shared space, apartments, high density, but does not hit um, what I'm seeing, at least, if you look on the PV on the L bar right now, you'll see 100 homes for sale between one and three bedrooms in single family. That's it, 100. And if you're talking to anybody who's thought about redesigning or expanding their home because of they're all working at home and doing things, that market is you're five months to having something done on your house right now. Oh sure, it's just not happening. The, the backfill there is extensive. And if anything, you've got people talking to people saying, I'll swap houses, I'll buy yours, you, you know, trying to negotiate because they don't want to wait for their home to be expanded or redesigned or, or those kinds of things. So all that to say, I think there is some people, there's a higher demand for that single family than maybe we would have thought um, moving forward because people at home more, they're not going in as much, which we would have said a year ago um, at this time. So I'm just curious how you're planning on capturing that data and demand um, for, for this market. I'm just curious. 
I think in general, we'll, we'll capture it through the, the, the retail, like real estate sales in the region. Uh, you know, like the, there's a, like the reality is at least, and, and I may be wrong, don't, I mean, but to me, uh, if, 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 a, if a person, is, if there's a single family home buyer that can't afford the hot type of house they want in Fayette County, uh, they're not just throwing up their hands and moving into an apartment. They're more likely just moving to another county, right? So um, in that sense, we can follow the demand of single family houses in the metropolitan region. Uh, we can show how the, the share of single family home sales or new single family home sales has shifted from Fayette County. You know, the percentage of in Fayette County has decreased compared to the region at large, et cetera. Uh, we could also show how the the price of homes has has shifted higher as demand uh, you know uh, exceeds ex supply. Uh, those will be reflected in the scenario if what we develop is that uh, no matter what we do in scenario one, we can't keep up with single family homes demand, or no matter what we try to do, you know there's only so many people we can transfer into urban, uh, you know, multifamily homes. Uh, but, but to your point, if we did nothing, um, you know, again, we're not looking at expanding the boundary. So it's not like I'm saying, uh, you know, people are just, you know, out of luck, uh, you know, if they want a single family home in Fayette County. But if, if we just went on scenario one and said the, the market will uh, proceed at the pace it's we will simply use that land pretty quickly and maybe we use it. And so I guess back to your question, how quickly will we use it? You know, like, will we be out in three years or five years? How will I, how will, if you're asking me, how will I know? I, I don't know that I can say that we have, uh, you know, can totally answer that question with 100% certainty, but that we can just go by what we're seeing in the data and the data is updated as, you know, on a monthly basis. So we're going to have the most current data available. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, again, when you do this a year from now or two years from now, you can update. Uh, sure. And you can see that how that demand has changed and where it's going. I think that's going to be helpful. And, you know, for the record, when you're working at home in, in Jesmond County, you're not paying net profit in Jesmond County. You're not paying your payroll occupational tax here in Fayette County. And I think that reality of people moving, which I know people who have, who've said, forget it, I'm going to pay private school and move to move south. It's cheaper and I won't pay the property taxes here and I'll do it. They're making those decisions and that That's is going true. to have an impact on our net profit. To what degree, we do not know, but I think that is a very real um, concession point when you say, when anybody says, they'll just move to someplace else, they will. And, and if they're working from home in a different county, that's different. Than, trans than coming into Fayette County and still working in Fayette County, but having to live somewhere else. And that's the reality that we are not gonna know about for a little while, but I think is a little stronger than what we may see. A, a, a fair point. And I think we'll get into that a little bit in the evaluation criteria because we do kind of touch on that. And, and that's kind of like, I think we should probably get on to that because that's kind of where a lot of these questions are about the scenarios, uh, but the, really they're about the criteria and there are, there are opportunities for everyone to, um, suggest ways we can improve the criteria to capture what uh, your concerns are. Um, so with that, if, unless anybody has any explicit questions about the scenarios themselves, about how they're you know, developed or characterized, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to John Buecher to go over the criteria. Okay, Mark, you're still driving. So um, okay. I'll tell you when we're ready. You'll probably know when we're ready to, um, to move. So okay. I can go ahead to the, um, to the next one. So um, first thing I wanted to, to point out uh, about the, um, some of these things is when we're talking about the demand for uh, different things, we're talking about demand for different um, uh, classes of real estate. So we're talking about different types of, of housing, um, commercial real estate um, and um, industrial. And, and that demand will be assumed to be uh, the same um, at any given point in time across the three scenarios. The three scenarios are the ways in which we might try to meet that demand and, and to show the ability of the land within the urban growth boundary to meet that demand. And, and so I think that may help a little bit in terms of understanding what it is we're, we're trying to do. 
Um, we're, we're not assuming the demand to be changing in the different scenarios. It's just how we're addressing that demand is changing in the different scenarios. And so in, the, in terms of what the, the scenarios and the models that we create for those scenarios, what they will tell us, uh, we'll start with, with housing. And again, this is a, a working session. So we'd like you guys to look at this list and tell us how to improve on it. Um, so what we'll be looking at is by the different um, housing types, you know, what are, what, how many units, um, you know, what percentage of the, of the market does that um, entail? And then uh, you, you can see, you know, where we are going to get that data. Some of that's going to come from PBA, some of that's going to come from HUD um, and other places. Um, but, you know, we're going to look at that across these different criteria. So type, ownership, occupancy, you know, how many affordable units, and then other specialty units such as student housing and senior housing. And again, what we'll be doing then is each of the scenarios will show us how much of those um, can be provided um, potentially within the urban service boundaries, depending on the, the assumptions that we make in the model. Um, so, you know, in scenario one, you likely would see, you know, fewer multifamily units. Um, you might see, um, you know, additional multifamily townhouse type missing middle type things in scenarios two and even more in scenario three. Um, so those are the kind of things that, um, that we would be looking at across the three scenarios. Um, and, you know, uh, putting in the categories for the uh, affordable units kind of gives us an idea of, our, you know, how are we able to meet that uh, demand as well. So any questions about the different housing things we're looking at or suggestions about other things we might want to um, look at when we're talking about the different housing um, classifications? Oh, that easy. Okay. All right. So we, we can always come back to these if you think of more stuff um, later. So Mark, let's go to the next one. And um, so this is commercial and also includes our light industrial and industrial. So in this one, uh, we're going to be more concerned about square footage as opposed to number of units. Um, but if we need to look more at units, we can, um, you know, please tell us uh, if we need to, um, to do that. Um, but again, we'll be looking at um, not only what we think the demand will be based on the CoStar data, but then, you know, how many square feet can, the, can, the, uh, can we provide within the urban service boundary um, at this point in time? And again, these calculations will be based on the, for the most part, the, the zoning um, code. You know, how many, um, how much square footage, what's the floor area ratio, what's the, how many floors are allowed, things like that will determine, you know, what that supply can be. Uh, it, it within the boundary. So uh, that that's kind of how we're looking at that. And I wonder if anybody has any comments or suggestions on on what else to look at there. That market's very dependent upon location. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, in other words, if it's in the wrong location, it's it's never going to be absorbed. And how can we um, how can we deal with that in, in building our model? Is it is it um, when we talk about scenarios two and three, you know, we're planning on being tactical. You know, we're not going to assume that we're going to get more office space just anywhere. We're going to specifically put in locations where we think um, this many square footage of, of this much square footage of office space can be developed. Um, so in being tactical with that. Um, is that something that potentially this group can help us identify, you know, where to be realistic about that? Is, is that a good way to approach that? I don't know. <laughs> There's are good thoughts. I know the, uh, you know, your office and retail demand is going to go down, but retail's always wanted to be either in Hamburg or Nicholasville Road. I think we're going to see that changing with the new economy. Um, Industrial is probably, you know, more dependent upon linkages, maybe access to interstates and things of that nature. Uh, retail is going to want a, a high visibility, uh, high accessibility street system linkages. It's going to want to be near the rooftops um, so people can, it's convenient. Um, I don't, I don't know that you can look at the whole market. I think you have to segment the market, break it into sections and look at availability in different sections. Thank you. 
on the housing, I would like to make a comment on the MLS. That is very good. And you look at the uh, inventory, how many months inventory is on hand or how many days inventory is on hand. And historically, a balanced market, I think it's around 100 days of inventory is on hand. And an unbalanced market, that's where it's a seller's market and prices are going up. Um, President Biden is going to get $15,000 credit for home buyers. We're going to see the demand is accelerating. Um, and our supply is, is not accelerating. So you're going to see prices going up faster than incomes by a factor of three or four times if we don't get supply at equal demand. On the question about does everybody want a yard, I love doing density developments. And yes, our customer is not a family with three children. It's a young people, it's empty nesters, and it's 55 and up. And they're the 55 and up. If they have this housing to move into, they'll abandon that house. It's good for a family that three or four bedroom home on a brick home, two car garage and a large yard, which is what everybody says they want. I'm sorry, I missed part of that. You're saying that, that they will if it's there, but their preference may not be? Or, or you're saying that their preference is still um, that house with the large yard for a family yes they still want that house with a large yard we can build our rear entry home uh, so that you have a streetscape that's not dominated with sidewalks i mean uh, driveways and blacktop do the rear loaded garage and that'll again that's going to appeal to a family without children because they want the backyard for children but not everybody you know not everybody has children um so it's a segmented market is what I'm saying. Not everybody wants a three-bedroom brick branch on a large lot. But when you ask people what they want, they all say that's what we want. When you actually get them out looking at product and they make their decision many times, they'll go for something else. And, and I think what, what I would say is that we do anticipate the scenarios as much as possible, um, you know, including a, a diversity of, of options, um, particularly as we try to understand um, what that demand is going to be. And so, you know, I think what we need to do is is take that um, that type of housing and, and break that out into uh, multiple categories. John, can I ask one question or maybe a comment more than a question? As I look at the commercial piece, mm -hmm. um, with so many more people working from home now, my, my heartfelt belief is that when this clears up, that office space um, needs pre-COVID will probably be less with companies looking to save some money on, on office room. Do we have a, a tool to measure that potential impact as relates to this and what we're trying to do? That's a conversation we've been having uh, internally, you know, with our group and, and with others um, ever since we started uh, this project, because we started this project, you know, in the middle of, of the pandemic. And, you know, unfortunately for, for us, you know, part of our challenge is to um, make sure that, that what we're using is the best available data. And that data is just not here yet. And so, what we, what we do expect to happen is that, you know, as these scenarios are run this time and when you run them in the future, um, you'll use the best available data, but you'll have to consider the results of those um, scenarios with, you know, other factors. And, and so we'll go through some of those other factors uh, in a few minutes. And, and some of those other factors you may have to consider is that um, the, that best available data is not yet really reflecting what you truly believe are the trends in something like the, um, the office market. And, and so that'll have to be part of the decision-making process. We can't make this a completely objective, you know, run the model and this is what your decision is gonna be. There's going to be some discussions, some subjectivity to it and some interpretation. And that's one example I think of once the, the results are out, okay, maybe over the last five to 10 years, this is what office demand has been, but we expect that to trail off. So we don't feel like um, we're gonna need to meet that, 
that much, that level of square footage for office, um, which might give us a bigger cushion for how long the land within the growth boundary can meet our needs. Um, or we might decide that, um, you know, in terms of something like the residential, that, you know, because there's that smaller demand in office, the growth trends don't really reflect what we believe will be the demand for certain types of residential. And so we might want to adjust our scenarios and our decision making to accommodate that um, just because we understand that there are some limitations to the data. John, um, if I may, I, I wanted to ask a couple questions or offer some thoughts about the housing um, in the notes column um, for type, for example, um, is single, are you thinking those, those notes are gonna be the sort of markers of the types of types? Because <laughs> um, I think it would, it might be beneficial to kind of expand that to include duplexes, maybe differentiate townhouses, mixed use. Um, I don't know how ADUs would fit in, in terms of making single family a multifamily. So I think there's a couple of other categories that maybe could, um, I don't know if that complicates the issue, but it seems like they're, you know, to just make it single and multifamily, perhaps. Um, yeah, that, and, and so, yes, to your point that the notes doesn't include everything. Those are just some of the examples. What we'll do is we'll break that down as far as we can. And, okay. and a lot of that depends on, you know, how we can build it into the model, what kind of data that we can actually get, um, because sometimes we don't necessarily get the difference in, in the data between um, certain types of developments, particularly when we start to talk about mixed use. Uh, sometimes that's a little bit more difficult. Um, so we'll, because we need it to be repeatable and, and you know, in five years or two years, however long it is before this study is, is rerun, we wanna try to make sure to the best of our ability that, you know, the data sources will still be there to pull the same type data. And so the further you break that down, the harder that gets. Um, so as we get further along, we'll have a better idea of what exactly those categories will look like. But yes, we do plan on being um, not quite so simple as single and multifamily. Okay, so that's not the level of detail or feedback you're looking for at this point. Well, it is. It is. Um, you know, it's good to point out that we, we didn't put enough in there. And you might catch us on one where we actually were, you know, had missed that. So any feedback you give us is, is great. Okay. Well, so to that point, I think, you know, with ownership, looking at models for land trust, lease purchase, or co-op would be, you know, rather than just making it binary with owner rent, I think there are some other models, especially as we look at scenarios two and three that could potentially expand uh, the sort of implementation tools for that. Um, with occupancy, um, sorry, for affordable units, I think also identifying sort of affordability thresholds so that there are uh, definitions that go with that in terms of um, 30 AMI, 50 AMI, 80 AMI um, specifically. I think that would also be good to sort of make that a bit more granular. Thank you. Sure. Perfect. Okay, so um, so I'm trying to take notes as we as we go here. So um, pardon me for that. I am as well. I'm stopping for a second. So, all right. So then this next slide that we're looking at is um, some other things that we'll compare across the scenarios are um, are you know some things that are related to how the uh, how the properties perform, and and this is going to need some additional detail, um, like some of the others. Uh, we're still working on this one. Um, but one of the things that some of you all that were involved with the selection process may have seen some of the uh, maps and um, some of the charts that were created by uh, Urban 3 on our team. And, and they've got a system where they really, what they do is they compare how these properties perform in terms of the cost, not only to develop them, but to uh, maintain them, uh, but also then what their revenue is back to the city in terms of um, taxes. And so we we're currently looking at the property taxes, um, the occupational license fees, trying to get a feel for how um, you know different types of properties perform. We're aggregating that to a level that protects privacy, um, but still allows us to do the analysis. Um, but what that will do then is help give us an idea of certain um, types of, how certain types of decisions really impact 
um, you know, that cost revenue analysis that, that the city will have to do. And so, as we know, certain areas um, like Overbrook Farm may um, be very expensive to develop because there's, you know, currently no uh, infrastructure out there. Um, and we also know that because of where that is and the type of development that's likely to go there, that, uh, you know, at the, um, you know, per acre level, it probably aren't going to produce the revenue that um, something might be able to produce if it's um, closer to downtown um, in terms of, you know, what it comes back to the city um, in terms of taxes. Those will be things that we'll be able to show and that we'll be looking at. Uh, because that will be part of the decision making as well. And that kind of gets back a little bit to the, um, you know, that conversation we were having earlier about single family is we do intend for this to guide decision making. And it, it may be that, you know, Planning Commission and Urban County Council look at the investment that will it take to develop some of these areas for traditional single family housing versus what the return is and decide that in the long run, uh, they might not want to go that route that they let Jessamine County have that development. Um, you know, we don't know that yet, but that's a possible in you know, a line of conversation uh, once we see the outputs of this. So any questions or comments on um, this type of analysis and those models? And again, we'll compare these across the three scenarios. Okay. All right. Um, so the next set of slides are things that we're going to look at that will be more about um, kind of telling the story of, of what the current situation is each time this exercise is done. And so, um, and some of them will be things that um, are also outputs from the models, from the scenarios, but they also will be used to help understand what's happening and what has been happening. And so, for example, you know, we will want to know how many acres we have in each of the different um, land use and zoning classifications. Uh, we will want to know how many are vacant and underutilized. And again, that's a conversation we're still having about what's truly, you know, vacant and developable or underutilized and, and redevelopable, you know, versus, you know, not developable. And, and we're still working on that. Uh, we hope to get some, some more, you know, guidance on that from folks. But as we do some tactical things in building the scenarios, we think we can deal with some of those, those issues. Um, so, you know, we'll want to know, you know, some of the environmental constraints in terms of floodplains, you know, brownfields. Um, you know, we want to avoid, obviously, development, development in the floodplain. Uh, but one of the things that will happen over time is as we develop more, our floodplains will change. Uh, and, you know, if we, if we do end up having higher amounts of rainfall, then our floodplains will change. So, you know, those are things that will have to be looked at. Unfortunately, the FEMA maps don't get updated as often as we'd like them to. Um, but, you know, we'll be looking at, at things like that in terms of, you know, what what's there, you know, what's available. Um, and then some of those will be things like, um, you know, we've got to kind of know how much area we're going to need for roads. And and you can't just assume away all of your, your land um, for certain types of development. You know that you're going to have to have um, certain amounts of it set aside for, you know, different types of easements, whether it be roads and utilities or other things. So um, those are just some some things that are kind of, this is what's what the current situation is, and this is what it might be with the um, scenarios as things to keep in mind, but not always things that would be used as part of that uh, definite decision-making process. Any questions about those? Or do you want me to, probably better if I go through a few more so you get an idea of what else is out there. So Mark, let's go on to the next one. Um, so we'll be looking at, uh, you know, we talked about this earlier, some of the popular graphic trends. And so, you know, what's the population now? What was it when we did it the last time? What's kind of that expected trend? Um, same with different types of um, um, households, uh, you know, how many units and, and diff um, household units. Uh, we, you know, how many people per household, because uh, those, again, will be things that will go into decision making. If we see that, you know, those trends are going one way, whereas the development trends have been going another way, um, that should be part of that decision making um, process. And then uh, one of the things that we added earlier today from a conversation is, you know, looking at uh, what's the overall population density and, and how does that compare to um, some benchmark cities that we might want to look at. 
So um, the other things that we've, we've talked about, again, these charts start to tell the story of what's happening and how to evaluate the scenarios. Uh, we'll be looking at, you know, building permits and, and, you know, what are the trend lines there? What types of units, how many acres, um, those kind of things. How's that been going? We can get that data back to the last five years um, and at least good data um, because of the switch to Excel um, data previous to five years is, um, is not as good, but we can get some of that. We can also get some of that information um, from PVA, we believe. Um, also kind of looking at overall employment, you know, what are the trends in employment and will that impact the types of decisions um, that could be made in terms of you know, opening up different uh, sections um, or pieces of property for development, um, depending on what the employment needs are. And, and one of the things that could go with that are things like, you know, what are the economic development plans for the city? You know, what types of, of, um, of um, you know, industries, what types of businesses um, is the city trying to recruit? And how does that translate to um, different types of employment? And then also kind of still looking at that, um, that commuter things and workers, you know, how many people are working in, in Fayette County, but not living in Fayette County and, you know, vice versa. Um, Cause those are definitely, you know, things that are trends that are changing. And I think we'll start to see that related to COVID as was mentioned earlier. Um, but again, that will sort of start to tell the story of, of what's happening. All right, Mark, what's the next one? Oh. So, um, also trying to understand the impacts of infrastructure, not only on the different scenarios, but, you know, what does it mean in terms of, you know, if we're going to go from scenario two to scenario three, you know, what's the difference in terms of transportation investment? What, what do we need in terms of transit um, and bike and pedestrian facilities? Uh, what does it mean in terms of offering um, utilities like water and sewer and, and others for different types of development? And, and so those will be things that, you know, one, what's the current condition and what is that conducive to, but also if it's, if it's an expansion area that doesn't have it yet, um, what does that mean in terms of, um, of cost and, and things like that? Um, because the capacity, the carrying capacity um, will be um, part of that um, calculation. And I think we've got one more on these. Oh no, we've got two more. So some other things that, that we think will be important to making are the municipal services. So, you know, how many and where are the, you know, police stations, um, fire stations, libraries, senior centers, you know, what parks and, and recreation, you know, what's the amount of, you know, acres of park space that we need per population, you know, things like that, um, because we can't lose sight of that as decisions are made about, um, you know, more and more development. Again, similar to what we were talking about earlier, if you don't save space for those things within the growth boundary, are you then going to have to expand the boundary just because you forgot to make space for these things? Um, so we, we don't want to leave those out. And then I think we had one more of these. Oh, no, there's two more. Sorry, there's a lot of them. Uh, so things like the environment, you know, we don't want to lose sight of the, as, you know, development happens, what happens with the tree canopy, impervious services, um, and those things, because again, those will be uh, you know, important to not only quality of life that we've got another slide for that, but also, um, you know, understanding how development um, patterns uh, will impact those things. And, and again, it may not be that, you know, you're going to make decisions about whether or not to expand or not expand the, uh, the boundary at some point based on the tree canopy, but you definitely want to have that and, and other things as part of that conversation and think about what the interaction is between those. And then, and then this is one that we're still um, struggling with a bit. We're working on this, but we want to see how we can capture the impact of, of development changes within the boundary on quality of life. And, and then, you know, how does that impact not only the decision makings, but then vice versa, if you do or don't expand the boundary, how does that impact uh, quality of life? So that, that interplay is going to be very important. So, you know, looking at things like accessibility to services, um, ability to take transit, um, you know, again, do we have enough schools? Are they in the right locations? Um, things like that. Exactly how we're going to incorporate all these things we're still working on. Um, so we're, we're open to suggestions and thoughts about all these things I just ran through in a hurry, but I kind of wanted to cover them all as a group just because I didn't want to have us start talking about some that we were going to get to in, in a few minutes. Um, so, you know, again, we're still trying to figure out exactly how we're going to use them, but the 
important part is that we want them to be a part of the decision-making process, a part of the conversation. And we'd like your help in not only identifying additional ones, but in maybe giving us some better ideas about how to incorporate them. I'm uh, really excited to see you using the Secure by Design and your quality of life assessment. I had the opportunity to uh, go to London, England and study that. It's pretty simple. It takes a lot of thought and it does make a difference. We've incorporated in some of our communities. And if people's car gets broken into, uh, you can just about guarantee they're gonna cancel their lease and move. On the infrastructure improvements to do uh, infill, I think we need to look at how that cost is gonna be shared. Right now, the person doing the infill pays for it. Like if you have to bring a water line to your property or upgrade a sewer line, the one person who's doing the new project pays for the whole thing. I think we need a, a privilege system where all the benefited properties share in that infrastructure improvement. And they would be based upon the square foot, square footage of property accessing this uh, new infrastructure. Thank you. That's great. Great feedback. Can I add a couple? And this is really good, John. I'm really glad to see you. And I agree with um, Dennis on the secure by design and some of those thinking. Um, accessibility to trails, walkability in parks, green space. Now that people are at home with their kids, especially, um, you're doing more of those things. So uh, ironically, things like dog parks and um, access to green space where you can feel free and, and trails are, I just know something that the council members have all been talking about when we say, hey, what are your people talking about? These are things that weren't as high as they were two years ago and are definitely things that people are talking about now as being amenities that they are asking for. Um, so that's just two pieces of that and the quality of life area that might be um, useful. And then I'm glad to see you put schools um, on there because I think that's another one that's a highly dynamic situation right now with people wondering, if they're just looking at schools and am I going to stay in the school district or not, um, or the school area? That's actually a conversation is pretty common. And then um, I wanna go back to the economy just for a, a second. And let me make sure I hear what you're saying on the, um, on the implementation of the designs, you know, we, we have talked about if you don't have space for manufacturing, why are we recruiting manufacturing? That shouldn't be maybe something we should do, or should we? And then who's making that decision? So my question is, is for my benefit, because I may be very just, um, I may not be thinking about this well on my, on my side, so maybe you can help me, which is when you're putting these scenarios together, are you basically thinking we have this much space in the boundary these are the kinds of things that we can have as an economy to grow, industries, uses in scenario one. Scenario two be a little, are these, and then three is, is that. Am I accessing what you're thinking well, or, or correct me, please? I think uh, I, I use it as, a, I'm trying to take a, an individual example. So you, you brought up manufacturing. And so, um, you know, what we would want to look at are, you know, what's the, what do we feel like the market will demand, um, you know, for manufacturing? And then um, what do we actually have available that's, you know, currently developable? And if, and if we find in scenario one that we have plenty, then we, in scenario two and three, we maybe not do much in terms of manufacturing. Um, but if we find that, um, you know, we've got a shortage then in scenario two and three, we may try to find some locations where different types of, um, you know, industrial uses would be appropriate and, and build those into, into the model and, and at different intensity levels or maybe different amounts um, in, for those, you know, for those scenarios. Um, and so in trying to be tactical about it, because it's, it, we don't want to be too, um, too general and too, um, trying to think of the word that I'm looking for. Um, it, basically, we want the scenarios to reflect, reflect a certain form of reality. And so just to say that you could change the zoning code to allow more industrial is not going far enough. It means that, you know, there are going to be certain areas that are going to have, could potentially have more of a certain type of industrial development. And then what does that mean in terms of meeting demand? 
Um, Got it. So, and I'm okay. My only other thought there is it's not just recruiting, it's expansion of current property too. You know, if you've got somebody who is an existing business who would like to grow and can't, that impacts it, the economy as well, you know, the, those limitations. So I was just making, that's helpful to think about. And I think it'd be helpful for us to know. Um, I think we have been discussing for a while, what kind of economy are we going to be as we grow? Mm -hmm. And what does that look like moving forward? And that is different to lots of different people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we were in this morning's call, that was explicitly uh, asked, it's like, will we talk to uh, Commerce Lex? Will we talk to uh, the various groups that are recruiting uh, new businesses to Lexington? And I take that to, yeah, and so the answer to that is yes. Uh, we definitely want to know what they're doing. Uh, and we know that that will inform what we expect our, you know, the demand, the demand side will be. Uh, but in those conversations, it is just as easy to ask, uh, what are the expectations for, uh, you know, expansion of, uh, of businesses that are here today? Uh, what are the trade-offs uh, that are being like considered about, you know, what would happen if we don't provide uh, the room to expand, you know, the, the, you know, the premise is relatively obvious that they could possibly leave. Um, again, yeah, it depends on who you talk to, whether that's uh, a, a terrible thing or just, you know, you know, a kind of a laissez-faire thing. But, um, you know, that th that's the, what I think we meant in, uh, or th with when we talk to those folks is there is obviously, the city obviously has uh, recruitment efforts in, pl in play. We wanna re reflect what those are uh, so that we are not ignoring some obvious uh, opportunity that everybody's uh, actively trying to get. Uh, Mark, I'd like to share a concept on the attracting businesses. Sure. Um, the businesses today are really interested in speed, how quick they can get up and running and uh, so it's, you almost have to spec build for them and have something that they can have ready to go in 150 days. Businesses are in and out of businesses and acquired, merged in less than two years. You go out and get a raw piece of land, take it through the process and permitting everything, it's gonna take two years to get it to them. So many times, uh, they're more interested in speed than just about anything. And we've got to find a way to deliver product to them quickly and get them in business. If I may ask, that seems, okay, so that implies a particular metric, maybe like days to market for land, for any particular piece of land. We could classify land as in its site preparation today to uh, be available to the business in an explicit amount of time. And then obviously there's less, I mean, the, another aspect of that could be cost. Obviously that maybe some site prep is more expensive than others, uh, you know, particularly if we're talking about infill development that has some, uh, you know, rehabilitation costs or other types of uh, constraints on for construction. There's an old saying in the business, there's three things, there's cost, there's time and there's quality. Choose the two that you want because you're not going to get all three. And I can guarantee you out of those, they're going to choose timeliness. And I don't know whether the next one will be quality or price, but if you can get what they want to them in a hurry, uh, budget is not as big, big as a, not as big as a challenge. Thank you. Uh, I don't, I, I, my screen is not necessarily set up well for seeing raised hands. Is there anyone else that has a comment or a question or an addition? Again, the, we really are interested in additional metrics. So uh, anything uh, you think is, uh, could be helpful, you know, just, you know, we, again, we can't say that we're going to be able to necessarily find the data that's, uh, uh, that we can use in a, 
simple enough or repeatable enough method me, uh, measure over time, but we, we, uh, we, this is just our starting point. So uh, if there's other opportunities or other uh, criteria that you think are important or possible, either now or obviously you don't have to email or any other type of uh, communication is fine as well. Mark, may I ask the group, uh, just as, as an opinion, this is Price, sorry, I might be buried in the, um, when I, and I'm sorry for being late to this presentation, but I believe it was the similar presentation from this morning, and I've, I've queried the group. As I listened to the presentation, I've, I've pondered whether there were metrics that we track, for example, in the hospitality industry and in rev par or in the apartment multifamily space when apartment rents get to a certain threshold that um, that apartments are built or hotels are built. And especially as we look at ourselves against peer cities, if we were to track, let's say in Columbus, when you know average daily room rate got to $175, Columbus built more hotels. As our average daily room rate ticks up closer to 175, can we anticipate new hotels? Or as apartment rents got up to $1.25 a foot, can we anticipate more apartment construction uh, compared to peer groups? And I, I didn't know if that if I'm explaining it very well, or if that made sense to the group as far as metrics that we should consider um, as we anticipate, um, you know, some various hurdles, because we probably can't control the whole market, but we, there might be some signals that we can glean, uh, especially as you compare ourselves to peer, peer cities. I'd like to speak to that if I may. This is Dennis. Essentially, it's supply and demand. So when you're demand exceeds supply, your vacancies go down. So what you would measure is vacancies. When you have high occupancies, then it's time to build more. And this is what your hotel operators and people like that watch. Uh, they look for demand generation, demand generators and occupancy rates in the market. Um, I don't believe that's gonna be a problem with hotels for a while. Uh, they're struggling pretty good, right? pretty hard right now. Um, in that term, in respect to that, does that imply that that vacancy is a proxy for the the the, ri the rise in prices? We if we, we would see that the vacancies go down as uh, prices rise, or you know they're related. So if we knew the vacancy, uh, we would know uh, how to capture what I think price was trying to get at. The as you see vacancies go down, you're going to see them lower in price to compete for the uh, for the occupant okay so the you, you can control that through supply or with supply you can't control demand but you can control supply and by bringing enough supply forward the prices will moderate right can I can I just come back circle back um, following up on Dennis's point I mean geography totally matters 175 dollars a night downtown. Um, you know, may trigger the need for more hotels in the downtown region, but you can still get a Red Roof Inn hotel out by the interstate for $59 a night. And um, which we were talking previously about how different sectors of the city um, may be more or less attractive for particular kinds of development. And I think that's something that we haven't talked about is the city of Lexington is not a uniform plane. Um, given the, the uh, corridors for transportation, given the, the proximity to schools, to jobs, I think we do need to kind of break apart the city and look at demand um, changes in various parts of town. I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> Maybe some kind of waiting system with proximity to downtown being, you know, highest value some sort of a distance decay function uh, from you know, the, the center point of the city? Well, I, I think uh, my first reaction to that is, yes, I, I agree. I think the segmentation of the city into like smaller geographical units is very relevant to understanding the relationship of price and cost and vacancy and all that. And that's part of the benefit of having a, a GIS database is we can set that up to do that type of analysis. Um, the question is how many geographies, uh, how, like, how many metrics do we try to compare at the, each one of those segment levels uh, and balancing that with, again, trying to keep something that's 
simple enough, manageable enough to move forward, uh, simple enough to be transparent. Uh, but uh, that has been brought up enough, uh, both internally and on the task force, that I, I think it is a very relevant idea to explore to the, the a, a significant level. I mean, I, I, I know that we are planning on doing it at some basic levels, and we had like maybe four or five zones originally, and you know maybe we need to expand it to like ten or more. But um, again, uh, we we haven't picked that kind of geography yet. We're probably still uh, early on to understand what the best way to do that. Um, but it is relevant, uh, and I think it's a very good point. Um, any other, I mean, I'm curious about one of the things that, you know, we, like I said, we, we were struggling with the quality of life issues because as you can probably tell, we have, um, uh, we have a, a better avenues for quantitate, quantifying square feet and acres and jobs and units, uh, determining like what is a, uh, you know, a, a distinctively different version of crime in one scenario versus another is a little bit more tricky. Uh, uh, being able to have any actual control over the placement of schools or hospitals that are not really within the, the you know, the, the, uh, the, the power of uh, the public sector per se. Uh, you know, they, those, the question is how much, I mean, I've heard some positive feedback saying these are things that are important. Uh, the, the question, uh, so my two, I have two general questions and uh, is this something that we feel like is important enough to be a, a significant component uh, that it's relevant enough that we should continue to pursue it? And if so, uh, is it, would it be possible to use more narrative or subjective measurement, more conversation about what the scenarios, how the scenarios are differ from each other. Uh, because uh, again, uh, if we, uh, if we, if we don't want to be arbitrary in how we quantify something, uh, but we also have very thoughtful, smart people, uh, you know, across the board that can, if we can agree on some narrative distinctions between these uh, scenarios and how they should be valued, uh, then we can move forward with these type of metrics. So I'm just curious as, uh, you know, we, I mean, as the project manager of this, you know, I, this, we have a certain amount of resources to do this work. Uh, I know our goal is to try to repeat it going forward. Uh, the first question is, uh, you know, are we biting off more than we can chew? And uh, if it's truly uh, important, uh, what is the best way to try to capture it? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Uh, the I think the answer to your question, are you biting off more than you can chew, is yes. <laughs> There's an awful lot of um, measures, metrics, et cetera. I think the, the question in my mind is, does that particular piece of information actually help us in making a decision about whatever it happens to be, um, whether it's zoning decisions or uh, questions of uh, how we uh, approach economic development it's not clear to me how crime rates, for example, how, it's not clear to me how that helps us think about the things that we're trying to think about. And there may be a number of other things, but I, I, I guess that's the big question in my mind. How many of these actually are going to equip us to make specific decisions about how we proceed? That's say. exactly the conversation Mark and I had yesterday and today as we were trying to narrow these down a bit and, and decide how to talk about them. And you, you raise an excellent point um, that we're still grappling with ourselves is you know, if we're going to include them, then we're going to try to collect data on them and we're going to measure them. Then, yes, we have to be very clear about what their role is in that decision making process. And, and we're not we're not all the way there yet. Um, and, you know, we welcome guidance from you all on that. Well, I'll say one more thing about that. I, it, it, as I looked over this very comprehensive list, I think the default position is no, don't gather the information on that unless you can make the case 
that this can contribute to ultimate decision making. So that may be too radical, but in my mind, there's so much data that the that narrowing down is more important than being comprehensive. So to the vice mayor's point, and I'll just piggyback, I think it comes down to housing because I think that's where you see most of those things showing up, where your kids go to school is relative to where you live, whether you have access to parks or trails or amenities or quality of life and green space comes down to where you live. So I think it's a housing as much as anything else. And that's just my personal opinion on that. And if it may, it may be more than we can bite off, if, if you will, but I think the, the parks did a master plan. Oh, sorry. My dog is next to me and has um, dropped my, um, my background. So sorry about that. Um, and I had a point and I just about lost it. Uh, the parks master plan. So um, com the acting commissioner, um, Monica Conrad, we did a master plan on parks just a few years ago and there was an extensive amount of data on what people think about quality of life as it, re as it responds to relates to those kinds of things. So you might be able to get quite a bit of data from that. Is it up to date? It's a couple years old, you know, but there's at least quite a bit there that you might be able to gather without having to do a ton um, new data, if you will. But that's why I think it matters for whatever it's sake. Mark, if I may add this quickly, um, I, th I think the key is how we use the data. Uh, I think it's important. I passed in the North End. If I'm looking to buy a home or live in the North End, I want to know what's going on crime-wise. We got to get that front and center and deal with it. That's a reality if I'm looking to buy a home in the North End of Lexington. I watch the news. I hear about it. Um, I pass the people that deal with it. Um, and it's not just here. Uh, I'm speaking for the city, but in this particular portion of it, that's a reality that goes into the decision making. And if I'm a developer, uh, that's information I want to know. But again, the key is how then do we use that data to make the decisions that are to be made? But I think to ignore it completely is to make a huge mistake. Thank you. Uh, I know it's a big question and it's kind of thrown out uh, quickly, but it is another, it, uh, like we said, it's something that we're still struggling with. And um, I, I take uh, take everybody's advice to, you know, heart as far as, yeah, we need to make sure that it's relevant and it's something that we can measure and simple enough. And I think there's opportunities, you know, that we still need to explore about how, uh, you know, we can uh, incorporate some of this stuff into GIS and maybe it's not as complicated, um, you know, we keep it at a simple enough level that we can in incorporate it, but not be tracking too much of any particular aspect, uh, you know, and keep it in general terms. Uh, and, we'll, and, and we can, we will obviously come back with more information about how, what we've learned, uh, but please feel free to continue to provide any insight you might want to uh, give us uh, as we uh, proceed over the next few weeks. Your, your question in regard to quality of life is specific to the build out for options one, two, or three for the current urban service area specifically. Not in, not in, because I think with that question, you'd want to consider expansion, the cost related of those items, the parks and walking trails and so on. Yeah, and to some degree, that's the thing is we can measure, especially as we segment things, we can measure accessibility uh, within different segments in the different scenarios. Um, and this is in, in theory that uh, amenities that are outside the urban service boundary are still available, uh, you know, uh, in, within these scenarios. We're just not looking at, uh, you know, new housing outside the urban service boundary in this study. In this phase, yes. Does anyone have anything else? If not, we'll move on to um, Craig's presentation. Thank you very much, Mark and John. Um, and then we'll have public comment. And Mark and John, you'll still be available at the end of the meeting, I assume, for yes. public comment questions. Very good. Craig, Thanks. you want to take it away? Chairs, in the in the interest of time, I know we're running over on meet on the meeting time here. Um, all of the um, updates I had were really 
um, announcements. And I'm glad to send an email um, to everyone if that's acceptable after the meeting today. Um, I can still answer questions through email, but I'd, I don't wanna um, hold up the public comments if there is any. Uh, if you could, if we could note very quickly, uh, the website is up and running. And just so the members of the public that are out there in, in today's meeting can can access it if you want, which is what LexSustainableGrowth.com, I believe. LexingtonSustainableGrowth.com mirrors to the project site where, or the study site where we're um, keeping agendas and, and summaries and, and that sort of information available, as well as keeping it updated so that people interested in participating will see like uh, today's meeting, for example, they'll be able to sign on directly from the website. There's a link there as well. So we'll be keeping that updated on a regular basis. And Craig, please, please also share, if you will, about the planning and public safety committee meeting that you would like people to attend if they could. Sure, I'd be glad to. So February 2nd, I believe, um, we are going to be making a presentation to the Planning and Public Safety Committee, which is a council committee. That will be an update regarding this study. Um, I will send an, an email um, to everyone, uh, all of the task force and advisory committee members. If you'd like to be there, we'd, we'd certainly like for you to be there um, in support of the study process. Um, so that again is February 2nd, uh, 1 p.m. is the time that meeting starts. So I'll be- Do we need to let you know who's gonna attend so you'll let them in? Um, it, it would be good to, to have a general idea of, of who's there to recognize them during the presentation and to potentially bring them in for comments as well. Right, thank you. Craig, can you please repeat the name of the website? Yes, ma'am. It's it's on the uh, bottom of it's on the footer of your agenda, and it's Lexington. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank it's LexingtonSustainableGrowth.com. We've Got also it. published it on the planning website, so there's a couple of different places people can find the information moving forward. Shall we open it up to public comment and question? If there are any attendees that would like to uh, speak to the task force members, please raise your blue hand and we'll bring you into the meeting. Co-chairs, I'm not seeing any raised hands at this time. Any other comment or question from um, panelists? Craig, you might want to also mention about the task force invitees being included in on the advisory committee. So they, the, the structure will change in our next meeting. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't, I didn't hear part of that. Starting in February, you might want to share with them, like in the notes, that the structure of our meeting is going to share where the invitees will be in. Sure, I'll, I'll include that in the email, but really essentially what's, what's happening there is we are, uh, as we had discussed in a previous meeting, we are moving to um, a format where we're using the advisory committee members to truly work out some of the details along the way. And then we will be reporting back to the overall task force. It won't necessarily change the structure of this meeting. All of the task force and advisory um, committee members will be advised, or, or I'm sorry, invited to this meeting, but we will be having separate meetings um, of the advisory committee between the monthly meetings of the task force, if that makes sense. And we'll be reporting back on a regular basis. So hey. thanks, that made my life easy. We just reported on a few of the items I was gonna include in the, in the email. So appreciate that. Good, good. All right, do we have any other co comments? We so appreciate everybody's input. I'm sure that this helps John and Mark immensely. I mean, this is a major task, major task, so. Council Member just, Bledsoe, Bledsoe, did you raise your hand? Yes, sir, I did. Um, thank you, I know you can't see everybody quickly, but um, I know two years ago when we started this process, we picked Wednesdays at three, and I remember saying at that time, it was a really hard time for me to make that. Um, given that my kids are no longer riding the bus, it's exceptionally hard. So if you've noticed the last few meetings I've been driving while trying to do this, um, so today I was able to work out transportation, but that's not that's not a typical Wednesday scenario for me. So I would just toss out if it's amenable that if anyone else is going to be open to shifting the date or time, I will continue to do my best. But it, it is it is challenging 
um, to be fully present as I would like to be on Wednesdays at three o'clock. So that's just a, I just want to put that out there, not for any discussion necessarily today, but just for consideration. Um, if there's an openness to having a, debt, a different time or date, um, it would be helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Randall? Did yeah, you? I had a question. Uh, if uh, obviously we've, we've digested a lot of information and format and, and uh, I guess the uh, uh, information we were given, if we have thoughts after this, uh, what's the best way to get those questions and comments back to uh, uh, Mark and John or Craig? What's, is, is there an avenue to do that? The, the website that you can leave comments on the website or you can email me, uh, okay. Craig or John, uh, but probably uh, I would start, Craig, with you uh, to keep it going through you so you're aware of everything? That's that's probably the easiest path to take because everybody is receiving regular emails from me with my information um, in those emails. So feel free if you'd like me to, to share uh, information with the project team, I'm glad to do so. Okay, thank you. Craig, back to Council Member Bledsoe's concern. Do we do you have ability to send a poll out, a doodle poll or something to, to members? To pay I, can, I can. Um, before I do that, it would be useful if there was a, a discussion um, amongst the task force members regarding just to get some some idea of uh, mm -hmm. what the potential times and dates would be. Otherwise, uh, out, uh, it, would be, it would be fairly random. Otherwise, if we could get some initial direction on that, that would be useful. With enough notice, I can be flexible. So. Anyone else have weekly time restrictions? Sometime after lunch is typically easier for me, um, but I can be flexible on the, the date, but mornings are typically tied up, but afternoons are pretty wide open. I think thir the third week of the month, there's a lot of board meetings. Um, we just need to be careful about the third week, I know. Wednesday worked well otherwise, or maybe earlier in the day on Wednesday. Even if we can move it to one o'clock on Wednesday, so we had one to three, if that would be amenable, that would be really helpful. If that's same time, same day, just a little bit earlier. I'll take two if that works. <laughs> It sounds like one o'clock works well, just from looking at the faces that I can see. Shall we, we shoot might, for if that? I could suggest a show of hands on that. That might be useful for the co-chairs. Is, is specifically anybody it does not work for? Maybe we took our own doodle poll on 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 Zoom or Zoom poll. Thank you, my 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 husband and people who watch me drive are very thankful for that. <laughs> so I'm clear on that point. We're talking about the same day, the third Wednesday, but at one p.m. Correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for meeting. And Anne, I hope I didn't cut you off a few minutes ago when I. No, no, it's all good. Well, I think it was a very constructive meeting today. I think, gosh, it's a lot bigger than I ever thought, but we're getting there. And your all's input is so helpful and needed. So thank you all so much. Thank you. So, do we hear a motion to adjourn? Move we'll adjourn. All right, second. Second. All right, you all have a wonderful rest of the day and thank you all so much for your time and, and everything involved in this. We'll get there. All right. Thank you, <laughs> thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.